Let's have some fun, shall we, today? Yes, we shall. Yay! 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 <laughs> Hello all of you little demons, Jules here for WhatCulture.com, back again with another episode of the awesomely named and awfully hosted Choose Your Own Adventure, the weekly medieval themed format where I, the crown jewels of WhatCulture.com, take a list chosen by you. Yes, you, the person who went outside for the first time in absolutely months and instantly got sunburned. Ow! Yes, you get to decide what list I dole out to you each and every week. And this week we have none other to thank than ba 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 the real Rico. All other Ricos are just pretenders. You've heard it here first. And their suggestion of video games that were pretty terrible, pretty average, mediocre video games, but had brilliant stories. And this is the thing. As much as video game forebearers would like to have us believe, having a good story does, in fact, immerse the player and keep them hooked from start to finish. Sometimes we'll actually play through pretty piss poor games in order to see out a fantastic story, and these are such entries on this list today. So let's take a look at them as I'm Jules, this is WhatCulture.com, and these are eight terrible video games, but with amazing stories. Now, before we actually begin, I do want to state something about the title that I've just just read out. My boss said to me that he's not going to allow it to be just video games that had great stories but not that great gameplay. He wanted the word terrible used. I don't actually think that a lot of these games are terrible in the sense. So what I want you to do is because I'm sure that there are going to be lots and lots of people who immediately start typing, oh this game isn't terrible. I want you to respond to them with, you big silly honey badger, did you not watch the intro? Because I'm right there with you. I'm, a, I'm just a cog in the machine, my friends. Anyway, let's crack on with this list as I'm Jules and blah, 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 blah. Number eight, Death Stranding. Now, the joke could easily be made that there's not actually enough of the plot that's able to be understood in Death Stranding for anyone to classify it as being awesome, but at the same time, what we do understand, the very, very small shards that do make sense in this very strange game, are actually pretty bloody amazing. Sure, sure, some of the messages about connecting with your fellow man, about treating each other with respect, and how pulling together as a society is the only way to make true progress are about as subtle as a brick to the bloody face. But you know what, at its core, those are pretty bloody essential messages. I do agree with the fact that they hammered them home because yes, they are good things to know and learn and have constantly reinforced in our society. In case you had noticed, I'm all about that sort of stuff. And even when the game's getting abstract, the one thing that you can definitely say for sure is that Death Stranding is never boring. However, you could probably say exactly that when it comes to its gameplay, or at least that's what some of the internet would have you believe. It does seem that the moment that people take control of Sam was the moment that the fan base divided sharply. Some people loved the laboriously slow and methodical walking mechanics and delivery mission-centric gameplay, and others, well, they just hated being post-apocalypse man Pat, and derided the actual meat of the game as being the worst bit about the experience. But whatever your take on this title is, we can all agree that at least Death Stranding was different. And you know what? In this day and age, that actually counts for a lot. Number seven, We Happy Few. I wanted to love We Happy Few so very much. But it just it was just a wet fart, wasn't it? Just a big wet fart. Big stupid wet fart. Stupid wet fart. <laughs> It was just a bit of a wet fart, wasn't it? In the run-up to the game's launch, the world was awash with trailers that promised an uncanny take on 1960s Britain, of a small town that uses a wonder drug called Joy to make them forget the horrors of what the locals did after the Battle of Britain in order to get the Germans to leave their little island alone. Oh uh, yeah, side note, uh, it wasn't Rainbow Rhythms. The aesthetics, the attitude, the overall creepiness of the setting lent well to a kind of Bioshocking, blighty vibe which resonated with many. It's just a shame that the gameplay itself didn't come close to scratching this very bizarre itch. Instead, what we got was a title that for the most part just came with the trappings of an early access game. I mean, we got ropey AI, we got recycled assets and a gameplay loop that was just stretched out because it was just based on one single idea and it drove it into the ground. This truly was, ironically, a world devoid of joy and yet the story, it was still utterly engrossing, enough so that many players saw it through to the end regardless of the grind that it put you through to get there. Coming out the other side of this game and learning of the fate of Wellington Wells was pretty brilliant, but unfortunately the gameplay getting you from point A to point B, whew, that was a bit of a slog. Number six, Brink. 
So Brink, for those of you who have not played it, is an FPS, but instead of standing for first person shooter, here it stands for flipping parkour shooter. And it takes place on a man-made island called the Ark. The original design for this monolithic structure was that it was going to be a self-contained city that would be self-sufficient when it came to resources and power. Yet somewhere in our human timeline, global warming causes the waters to flood most of the world and leaves only pockets of survivors. Rumors then begin to swirl that the Ark is still active, and so many seek out its safety and supplies. This results in thousands of people inhabiting a structure that was not made for this many, and soon the Ark becomes a tinderbox waiting to ignite from raging class tensions and extreme divisions in wealth. That sounds pretty bloody epic, right? It's basically like High Rise if it was made into a video game. It's got parkour thrown into the mix as well, and it's all about shooting your fellow man in the face. Sign me up. But there's just one problem. That story that I just mentioned before is not conveyed anywhere in the actual gameplay itself. Seriously, the game feels like two different titles that have been stitched together as all of the tension, nuance and intrigue of the setting is utterly blasted apart by the mediocre AI and ridiculous repetition of its core matches. And the single player experience, if you can even call it that, was the absolute worst because what they did here was they just took the multiplayer maps and made you play through them again and again with AI teammates. And they are awful. They are the worst for one major reason. There's actually a lot of love that's been put into the levels, right? And there's actually a few little details here and there about the wider story that's going on. But you won't see a single jot of it because you'll be camping on the main objectives because for some reason your AI teammates have been programmed not to secure objectives. Meaning that you're just going to be like, Ooh, what a great world I'm in. Just sitting on the toilet. Cool. Cool beans. Are oh, you having a firefight over there? I'll be right with you. I've just got to babysit this for a bit. It's a great story that's been let down by its mediocre approach to gameplay. Number five, Deadly Premonition. So let's set the record straight right now. I absolutely adore Adore Deadly Premonition, and for all of its quirks and foibles, I do think that it stands pretty proudly aloft at the top of the gaming pile as a piece of auto masterpiece man's ship. That, that, that's not a word, but it kind of definitely fits the off-kilter tone of Deadly Premonition. However, it is also a title that, from a gameplay perspective at least, is utterly terrible. Take for example the shooting mechanics, which you will definitely use a lot in this game, and the fact that the auto-aim pulls you to shoot enemies in the arse, which makes it immediately jarring, as are the stock sound effects for the guns, and the fact that everything feels as if you're firing wet paper pellets at enemies instead of bloody bullets. <laughs> and how about them driving sections, eh bud? In which you have to obey the speed limit and can actively run out of petrol and be stranded in the wilderness. There's realism, and then there's being an utter arse, and Deadly Premonition full-on moons you the moment that you open up the game case. Ooh, a butt. However, I know deep down that this is all part of its charm, that its strange resistance to be fun is what makes it so utterly alluring. And while I might grind my teeth into dust getting from point A to point B, I'm doing so because the story is actually bloody brilliant. The tale of a red-coated killer who only stalks their prey in the rain and the fact that this town seems so unwilling to help you solve the murder all add to this growing sense of paranoia. It's a game that makes you feel like you've just ended up in the deep end of the swimming pool before realizing realizing that you can't actually swim. And while the gameplay will definitely try and hold your head down like it's a high school bully saying, ha ha ha, you're not gonna enjoy this experience, the actual story provides a sort of life raft, something to hold on to, a buoyancy that carries you through the rest of this tumultuous wave of a journey. Look, look at that metaphor. I tell you what, James, sometimes I just, they, they come off the top of the head, off the top of the dome, off the top of the egg like that, and I'm just kind of like, bang! You know. This is why they pay me the medium bucks, isn't it, mate? Proud of myself. Shouldn't be. Right, anyway, let's go on. Number four, getting over it with Bennett Foddy. So, simply uttering the name Bennett Foddy might be enough to cause a few of you to have sort of Vietnam War style flashbacks, and I totally understand that because I too am one of the effective. We've all ridden the snake all the way to hell, my dude, but you know what? This is a safe space, and now we're going to act as a support group and talk about this bloody bastard. Now, if you're to ask me what I truly think of getting over it with Bennett Foddy, my brain is going to tell my mouth to say the word master. 
masterpiece, as on paper this game truly is something special. It's an incredibly tough and frustrating set of controls that meets horrendously cruel level design. This is a title that aims to keep you at arm's length at all times. Or so it seems, for as you ascend, clawing and scratching your way up the mountains of random objects and finally into space itself, you start to see what this game truly is about. It's about perseverance, it's about determination, it is about proving to yourself that you can bloody well do this. Therefore it becomes a narrative that you create the more that you suffer through it, and the dialogue that you have with yourself truly is the most important story going on here. It's frankly disarming. It is very, very shocking to be put into that scenario by a video game, and that's why, on paper at least, it's bloody amazing. But like I said before, that's what my brain wants my mouth to say when talking about getting over it with Bennett Foddy, but what actually comes out is, what the f*** are these f***ing controls? I'm going to body Bennett f***ing Foddy! James, do you want to do some musical interlude to chill out a little bit like now? No. I feel him. I feel him. I feel Jeremy. I feel Jeremy coming. Number three, 13 Remake. Okay, so I know that a lot of you will have looked at the title of this entry and just gone, 13, Jules, are you absolutely mad? 13 was a great game. It was a great game, you absolute fat baby. You stupid boohoo baby, you fat, ugly idiot, you stupid cuck. Ow. Um, yeah, it is a great game. Look at the second word in the in description, idiot. It's the remake that I'm having to go at. Got too real right there. And yes, you know what, my friend, you'd be right, it is a fantastic game. However, there is one glaring problem with this title that absolutely earns its place on this list, which comes in the form of the 13 remake that dropped in November of 2020. A video game so bad that the 2003 version is far superior in every single way. What this remake did was take a video game with a razor sharp storyline about an amnesiac assassin fighting for survival against those who think that he's killed the president and just smeared it with every single brand of dog feces they could find, turning it into an utter stink fest of missing sound effects, terrible animation, horrendous enemy AI, and gameplay that somehow feels even further back along the evolutionary chain than the original game. What we have here are the perfect embodiments of our two deities that inhabit the choose-your-own-adventure timeline. On the one hand, you've got the 2003 glorious masterpiece that is Slime Jesus right here. This is the guy. This is the big ledge, the big man himself. With peace and love, he is both. Okay? Good boy. But on the other side, oh no, it's the remake. Here he comes. Bills a blob. Bills, get, get down. Get down, mate. Get down. I can't stop him from coming down because unfortunately the remake has dropped and unfortunately it's probably the version that so many people are going to play because when you think about it, if somebody goes up to you and says, hey, look, have you heard of 13? No, I haven't. Oh, it's an old game. I don't have the relevant consoles to play this on. Oh, look, there's a remake going out. I'll check that out. Oh, what is this? Utter fire. This skip fire. This raging, blistering pile of condoms that's leaking out into my console. What is this? Is this what 13 is? No, it's Beelzeblob. Okay? 2003 good, 2020 bad. Long story short, uh, I wish that I could be hit with a dose of amnesia so I could forget that that game exists. And just remember the 2003 times. What happened in 2003? Uh, Funeral for a Friend was still big. Did they release hours in 2003 or was that 2006? I'm gonna have to look that up actually, hold on. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, Funeral for a Friend was around, uh, casually dressed and in deep conversation was out then. That was an absolute banger of an album. And if you disagree with me, well, that's your own opinion, isn't it? Number two, Ride to Hell Retribution. Right, okay, so I can almost hear the entire comment section just hammering their keyboards into dust right now, saying, what the hell, Jules, are you going insane? And yes, I am. But also, just give me a moment and I'll explain. I know that Ride to Hell Retribution is a terrible game. In fact, it might well be one of the worst games that I've ever had the displeasure to play. It is a broken mess of shoddy fighting and driving sections and genuinely feels like the budget for this title was whatever could be scrounged out of the back of a bloody couch, as only this lack of care and finance could explain the lack of polish presence at every turn. However, deep under its well-baked and very filthy crust is actually a story that could, and I want to stress, 
could have actually been pretty decent. Now think about it. A war veteran returns home to a country that's grown strange to him, his family is being pulled apart, and all he wants to do is reconcile with his younger brother. Though awkward at first, the veteran and his younger brother begin to bond over their love of bikes, and soon the pair seem to be building a once thought burned bridge. However, in an unwarranted scuffle with a rival biker gang, the vet sees his brother get his throat cut and thus sets him on a path of revenge. Now that actually sounds pretty decent, right? And that's because it actually was, up until the game realised after the first five minute mark that it had blown all of its story wad everywhere, and then just decided to kick the piss out of your patience for the next umpteen hours. It's a terrible game, but I'm just saying, story-wise, it could have been good. And number one, The Order 1886. Okay, so I want to do a little test with you all here today. Jazz and James, please join in as well. I want you to put your hand up in the air, right? And then take it down when you lose interest in the video game that I'm about to describe, okay? You're a secretive part of... She put her hand down straight away. I Fine, whatever, I'm just going to carry on. You're a secretive order of monster hunters. The game is set in Victorian England, in which you use high-tech steampunk weapons and Tesla cannons to blast apart werewolf and man alike, and you're also about a thousand years old thanks to some mysterious liquid that you drink that makes you nigh on immortal. Oh, and also, some of the events of this parallel universe cover Jack the Bloody Ripper. Okay, so let's just do a little check here. Apart from Jazz, pretty much a full house, right? Everyone's still got their hands up because that story sounds utterly bonkers and equally brilliant. But now what I want you to do, my friends, is take that raised hand that you had in the sky and turn it into a middle finger and then start shaking it very, very angrily because that is basically what the developers did when it came to taking that story and then applying it to the gameplay because, my God, they do not mesh well. Everything from the gunplay to the lichen battles feels like it was copy-pasted from the last generation of consoles and did little to show off what the PS4 could do other than aesthetically. The story elements of this game needed much more time to be fleshed out, but unfortunately, this ended up resembling a right mutt. So here you are, in a world that looked amazing, it sounded amazing, and had so much potential, and you were just running around just going, hey, have I not played this third-person action shooter many, many times over? Uninspired! Uninspired! That's me firing the uninspired Tesla cannon, by the way, in case you are wondering. It wasn't just becoming a duck, because not one. Anyway, that's the end of the show. Moving on. <laughs> And there we go, my friends. Those were eight terrible video games. Remember, not my titling here, with awesome stories. I hope that you enjoyed that. And please let me know what you thought about it down in the comment section below, as well as your suggestions for next week's episode. If you'd like to chat to me further, you can do so over on Twitter at RetroJ with a zero, or you can swing by Live and Let's Dice on Twitch, where I'm doing all of my streaming outside of work. And it'd be great to see you over there, my friends. But before we go, I want to talk to you about one great story that I know is ever expanding and changing right in front of my eyes and that is your story that is your life story and I want it to have a bloody happy end. So in order to do that, I just want you to remember to be kind to yourself. Take a break, especially if things are starting to feel overwhelming. Talk to people about your problems because a problem shared is indeed a problem solved. And remember, above all else, one very important thing. You are a massive ledge and you deserve love and respect. All right? Now go out there and absolutely smash it. As always, I've been Jules, you have been awesome. Never forget that, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye.